All right. Before I begin, I wanted to show you something which is unique. I'm going to hold it up. Can you see it? It's called a preaching pillow. So that if Sherman gets boring, you can just fall asleep on it. But I use it to prop up my props. <laughs> In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. This morning's gospel, we read about the birth of Jesus. Now, Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king. The emphasis is not so much about Jesus' birth, but underlying the obvious. The focus is on what God has done for humankind. Is that supposed to be up there? Okay. Apparently what <clears throat> caused a great deal of consternation when Jesus was born was the fact that there was another king already in place. And of course, we all realize that that person was Herod. And so Jesus comes as the new king. And Herod is very upset. And so he sends out Numerous people to find out where the, where the infant is laid so that he can come and, quote, worship him. And we, re we read the words in the hymn, come and worship the newborn king, as we sing from our hymnal, which introduces early on the conflict which is now in the making, the conflict of two kings, Jesus, and as I said before, Herod. Your task and mine is to internalize these events of over 2,000 years ago. When we apply this story to our present time, we too are experiencing a time of deep change, not only change, but extreme danger, which we have been through and continue to be at this very moment. Every single one of us has had a journey in our own lifetime, periods of conflict and of reorientation. One of my favorite theologians from Canada is Herbert O'Driscoll. And he says in his book, A Year of the Lord, in every society, political theory is having to change radically in response to new realities. And this has been, as you realize, politically, a year of interesting times, a year of great change, and a year of surprises. The church is having to search for new ways of ministry. I remember when we were told there would no longer be worship in the person. <clears throat> How do we deal with that? What kind of services are we going to have? We're going to meet outdoors like we did and, uh, and then pass communion out in little plastic bags? Uh, or are we going to try and come to church and sit six, six to 20 feet apart? On Sunday, sometimes we go, we listen to the National Cathedral and they have a very unique situation there. They have a quartet, <clears throat> which is pretty jazzy. And then they have, uh, of course, a freestanding altar. But the communion service is the same as it will be this morning. And that is that celebrant, Father Gary, will celebrate just as the Dean of the National Cathedral celebrates. And then the service is over and the prayer is offered to receive the Holy Sacrament and Spirit and the service ends. <clears throat> but I find that uh, in those services, it brings back all kinds of memories of, 
of my own time and life in the church. So Good Shepherd is still searching for better ways to, uh, to do the service. And I think it's still going to be a while before we can uh, come to church and sit in the pew and, and listen to the service. As we celebrate the gift of Jesus' birth, each one of us will continue to journey through uncharted experiences. The wise men gave their gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh. And uh, I'm still waiting for mine because my birthday is on Epiphany. And I haven't seen any of that, but I have ridden a couple of camels across the desert outside of Cairo. And that's about as close as I've gotten <coughs> to the scene of Christ's time. But if we are going to try to internalize this story and not see it from a great distance, which some people tend to do, they say, well, that happened 2,000 years ago, and this happened 2,000 years ago. What meaning does it have for us other than something historical that took place? And I think we've been asked to somehow or other find ourselves in the context of that first epiphany, that first manifestation. And so this morning, I'd like to kind of share with you a few things that I think would be helpful uh, for us to kind of get, it, get inside the ethos, inside the space of that time. I think, I think that's a good thing to do. Each one of us is unique. All of us have gifts, not gifts you can purchase in a store. Your gold, your frankincense, and your myrrh might be far more. But what is the, what is the gift that you could offer? You know, we're, we're all different, and yet we're children of God by, by our baptism, inheritors of the kingdom of heaven. And so think about the gifts <clears throat> that you inherently have. And I would like to begin by saying, how about the gift of your energy? You know, this has been a trying time and a lot of people are literally, you know, they're kind of walking around in a day saying, well, what can, what can happen next? What surprises are we gonna get? And um, <clears throat> so your energy is very important at a time like this, but your energy can also be a gift to do the work that God has sent you to do, which probably at this time is to pray for people and to support some people you know who are having a difficult time. Your integrity. You know, recently, I've been watching a lot of movies and I am shocked, literally, and I'm not a person to be easily shocked. And I've been through a lot of experiences that uh, if I were shocked, I wouldn't have survived it. But the point is, what about your integrity? How do you feel about yourself? Do you feel as good now as you did a year ago in terms of your personal integrity, your ability to stand for what you believe. And then there's your brain. <laughs> you know, that's a gift we can give to God, our thinking. Look at the amazing things that have happened this year. A lot of it happened far, far above us in outer space. But think of all the people <clears throat> who invented situations and machinery that could get us not only to the moon, but beyond. And this continues and continues. And perhaps the most important thing is on, what about <clears throat> our people who are out front, the nurses and the doctors and the scientists? This all comes from the human brain, does it not? You know, we, uh, I have to admire the medical profession. I always have. I've never been one to uh, kind of say, well, you can't trust them because I've had to trust them on a number of occasions. But I think it's wonderful that the gifts that they have given to us and are now exercising to save the lives of thousands of people, not only here, but, uh, but across the world. 
So think about what you can offer intellectually uh, to God as a gift to the Christ child. We all have some intellectual abilities of one kind or another, some perhaps endowed with more. I'm not a scientist, never have been, obviously never will be. <laughs> but uh, some of you are, and some of you, as you look back in your life on your careers, <clears throat> whether it's raising children or doing some mathematical genius stuff for outer space, I have a grandson who's studying physics, and I, I told him one day, I said, you know, Galen, when I reached algebra, I reached the, the pinnacle of my mathematical ability. I said, I can do geometry because it deals with things I can see, but forget about algebra. So I sort of quit, quit the mathematical field at that point in my life. Uh, <clears throat> but there are other things that I can do. Then there's your loyalties, your deepest elements of heart and mind and soul and strength. I suspect that your loyalties have been tested a great deal through this past year. Loyalties to uh, friends, loyalties to the church, loyalties to the nation. Uh, we're not the only, the pandemic is not the only crisis we're facing as, as I speak to you this morning. Or other crises, what's going on with the loyalties to the, uh, to the Constitution of the United States, to the courts of law. These are things that are, you know, are important in our lives. I think this year has at least taught a lot of people to get serious about, you know, casting their ballot and voting and taking all that. I don't know about you, but when I was in, in elementary school, we had a course in civics and we had to learn things like uh, uh, the basics of, basics of democracy. Uh, and so we were, you know, in those days, back in the, in the 40s, we learned a lot. But I think one of the things that helped us in the 40s was, was World War II, because everybody got involved, whether it was having a victory garden or, or not using as much butter or sugar or things like that made us aware of what was going on. Of course, there was unanimity towards the war itself, not like what happened in two recent wars where it became a political football. But I remember my mother, we had, a, my mother's English, and uh, we had the RAF pilots over for Thanksgiving and Christmas because they were they came to Long Island to train on Roman aircraft, which they used. And so my uncle being a British Naval officer in World War I, he would invite all these RAF guys over. That was kind of exciting. Uh, but it was things that people did that helped the effort, you know, war bonds and all that. My class in elementary school bought a fighter. <laughs> Can you imagine that? They bought a wildcat. And the Navy sent a pilot down and he addressed us in the auditorium about his experiences <clears throat> in that aircraft. Well, I mean, that was, that was a highlight of my life at that point. So that has a lot to do with our loyalty. It has a lot to do with uh, our integrity. So as I said, we too are children of God. And I keep remembering that if we're going to get, <clears throat> as Herbert L. Driscoll says it, if you want to get inside the situation, internalize it, these are some of the things that he mentioned. And uh, I would, you know, when you go home this afternoon, think about the gifts that you have. Think about your intellectual abilities and, and all those things. And, uh, help us to understand to some degree what was happening back at that first manifestation at the Epiphany. There's a hymn that I think is wonderful and that is, breathe on me breath of God, 
fill me with life anew. That's him 508. So that I may love what you have loved and do what you would do. There it is. We even say in the Eucharist, here we present, O oh Lord, ourselves, our souls, our bodies to be a holy living sacrifice. And, that, and those two items, I think, sum it all up, which is we're not just, we just don't just go to church to listen. We go to church to be a part of the drama of redemption, part of the Holy Eucharist. And our life in Christ is enhanced by our ability to sometimes get inside of all that and to experience, as I'm sure some of you have done, moments of closeness to God. I find that to be true in my life. And um, it's, it's important that, that we continue our life in Christ, even under these difficult sessions. So I say to you this morning, not only Happy New Year, but God bless all of you for your involvement in the life of the church, and especially Good Shepherd. And blessings go to Gary and his ability to uh, come up with unique things that help us in our worship. So we give thanks on this beginning of the new year for the epiphany of Jesus Christ and manifestation to the world, not just to the local. And um, so God bless you all. And thank you for this opportunity to, uh, to be the homilist. Amen.